Good morning, everyone, and welcome, or good afternoon, depending on your time zone. My name is Edith, and we are here to present another webinar on IIH, specifically on glymphoedema of the brain and how it impacts IIH. This morning, we have Dr. Stephanie Link. She is an interventional neuroradiologist in Paris. She is also a researcher and focuses on research of IAH, cerebral venous, and lymphatic physiology and vascular malformations. We are very honored to have you today with this exciting latest and greatest um, research that you have produced. And as our moderator, we have Dr. Pierre Gobin. He is also a neuroradiologist at Wheel Cornell Medicine in New York and has a very deep interest with IAH and invasive surgical procedures to treat acute stroke and eye tumors. So we welcome you both. And this is a deep dive, a lot of, a lot of pathophysiology. So please, if anyone has any questions, we may reserve some of them towards the end of the lecture. If everyone can place their um, mics on mute. And if you have anything you'd like to ask, please put it through the chat. And I promise you, we will address all of your questions by the end of this hour presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and put myself on mute and hand it over to Dr. Link and Dr. Gobin. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you, Edith. Uh, Stephanie, let's start. Okay, let's start. So hello, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Stephanie Link. I'm working in Paris uh, in the Pitié Salpetria Hospital. I'm actually an interventional neuroradiologist, and I also work in the Paris Brain Institute uh, on idiopathic intracranial hypertension and, uh, and venodural disorders. So I will uh, speak about our research project on uh, IIH and our hypothesis uh, about the lymphatic system, the lymphatic vessels, and idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Uh, our final purpose will be, I hope, to elucidate the cause of this disease and maybe find a uh, new therapeutic option uh, with uh, medication uh, to treat this uh, disorder. So first of all, I will, uh, I will, do, I will explain a lot the, the physiology of the CSF uh, circulation in the brain. And uh, I will uh, go more in details with the glymphatic system, uh, which was discovered in 2015. So it's a very new concept and uh, it's a very active field of research for many neurological disorders. So the glymphatic system is the circulation of the cerebrospinal fluid in the perivascular spaces of the brain. So if we start with the beginning, the CSF is located in the subarachnoid space then it enters the brain uh, around the very arterial spaces of the brain, and then it goes inside the glia and the brain parenchyma using a water transporter, which is aquaporin-4. And then it crosses the brain and it cleans the brain from its metabolites, so uh, like uh, tau protein or beta amyloid protein. And then it goes <clears throat> in the perivenous space uh, around the big cortical veins, uh, and this is what we actually know uh, about the glymphatic system. But what we don't know is how the glymphatic outflow uh, exits the brains. So this is a big piece, a big, uh, a big way of, of research because this is uh, the exit of the glymphatic system. So this is how uh, the brain metabolites are ex excreted from the brain and uh, how the interstitial fluid of the brain drains. So, I had a big interest in IIH and I, I think I immediately focused on this circulation because as you can see, um, it's all the circulation of CSF in the perivascular spaces. Uh, and we will, we will uh, see later that it may be involved in IIH for sure. So if we want to summarize the circulations in the brain, there are two circulations in the brain. There is a blood circulation, which is already very well known which is the circulation of the blood uh, in the artery, capillary, and veins. Uh, this circulation is regulated by the neurovascular unit, uh, which allows the permeability of the blood-brain barrier. In parallel to this circulation, we have the glymphatic circulation. 
which is uh, what I described on the previous slide, the circulation of the CSF uh, along the arteries and the vein. And this circulation is not only involved in the feeding of the brain, but also in the clearing of the brain from, the, from its metabolites. And this circulation ends up uh, in the lymphatics, but probably also in the vein. So this is uh, what we will uh, discuss later. But these two circulation for sure converged at the dural venous sinuses. And this is very, very interesting because idiopathic intracranial hypertension is a disease of the dural venous sinuses. So we have to consider the circulating lumen of the dural sinus, but we also have to consider the wall of the dural venous sinuses, which is the perisinus. In this perisinus, uh, a lot of things happen. I will describe this in the uh, next slide. But as you can see, if you consider the, the vascular circulation, you have the lumen of the cortical vein here. And here you have the perivenous space with the brain metabolites, which are excreted here. And all these converge at the dural sinus. But we don't know exactly how the connection uh, occurs. And so the perisinus uh, has long been uh, considered as a uh, like a nine nut fibrous membrane, but it's a very active uh, membrane since it's a, a free and an immune platform for the brain. So all of the neuroimmunity traffics at the perisinus. As you can see, the perisinus is the dura mater that covers the dural venous sinuses. So you have the dura mater here and the circulating blood here. You, you have a lot of uh, immune cell trafficking from the bone because the myeloid cells uh, which, uh, which are used by the brain come from the bone here. Tra they traffic uh, in the perisinus and then they are delivered to the brain and to the CSF. And you also have a, a T cell trafficking uh, coming from the venous blood of the dural sinuses, which are uh, uh, you have a captation by the endothelial cell of the, of the veins, and then it goes in the perisinus and it's delivered to the brain. So all the neuroimmunity of the brain is in the perisinus. So it's a, a, a very interesting point in our, uh, our specialty because uh, th this is not just the wall of the vein. It's, it's more than that. It's, it's a neuroimmune and it's a free platform. And the other thing is that there is drainage of CSF in this perisinus because as you can see, there are small channels here, which correspond to dural lymphatics. And these channels uh, cap the fluid from the lymphatic system here uh, at the venodural junction and from the CSF2. So you have two uh, parallel circulation, the venous circulation, the lymphatic circulation, and you have all an immune ecosystem at this perisinus, uh, meaning that many neurological disorders may involve this perisinus. So you, you have the lymphatic vessels here. I will detail them uh, in this slide. So interestingly, these vessels were initially discovered in 1787, and they were completely forgotten by the scientific community. And the basic dogma of neuroscience is that was that uh, the brain had a neuroimmune privilege, meaning that they, they, there were no lymphatic in the brain. So th this uh, concept uh, is uh, has, has dramatically one. changed since huh? 2015. I don't see one. Since uh, in 2015, uh, the lymphatic vessels were first discovered in mice, and they were imaged in 2017 in humans. And as you can see, these lymphatic channels, which are live one positive and are in green, are very parallel to the venous sinuses. And in my opinion, these two circulation are totally codependent and they need each other to, to have a good regulation of the CNS free homeostasis and of the neuromon surveillance of the brain. So if we want to be a little bit, a little bit pragmatic now, uh, in the CSF drainage, you have to consider two CSF outflow pathways. This concept is currently debated since a lot of people in neuroscience think that there is no venous drainage of CSF. I'm not, I don't, I'm not totally agree with this concept, but 
let, let's start with this slide, which is probably not very accurate, but it's uh, more simple. So you have the venous outflow pathway. It's a drainage of the CSF uh, through the arachnoid granulation to the venous blood of the dural venous sinuses. And you have the lymphatic outflow pathway, which is a drainage of the CSF and interstitial fluid to the cervical lymph nodes. And this uh, can, can use uh, either the lymphatic dural vessels or can use the cranial nerve sheet too. And this drainage is to the cervical lymph nodes and the other drainage is uh, going to the lumen of the vein. And I will go more in detail. You have basically two kinds of circulation of CSF in the brain. You have a circulation which aims to regulate the intracranial pressure uh, because the first compartment which is decreased when you have intracranial pressure is uh, the liquid compartment. And you have another circulation that I detailed previously, which is the circulation of the CSF uh, in the glymphatic system. So this circulation is more a metabolic circulation and aim at uh, clearing uh, the metabolites of the brain and to allow the neuroimmune surveillance of the brain. So this circulation, the circulation of CSF can be divided in these two. Uh, aims. So you have the production of CSF in the choroid plexuses of the brain, and then you have a part of CSF which goes in the subarachnoid space, and another one who, who goes, which goes uh, to through transepidermal resorption directly to the perivascular space. Here you have a direct CSF re resorption, uh, which is uh, like the one we we all learned in the medical school. Uh, which correspond to the drainage of CSF from the subarachnoid space to uh, the venous blood through the arachnoid granulation and also to, to dural lymphatic and cranial nerve sheets. And you have the circulation of the CSF in, in the lymphatic system, which end up, uh, in my opinion, this is not proven, again, it's just a theory, uh, in the vascular arachnoid granulation to the vein and in the dural lymphatics uh, to the lymphatic circulation. These two circulation, uh, uh, are very, it's very important to uh, differentiate them because the first one is just to uh, balance the intracranial pressure and the other one uh, is to, uh, like I said, clean the brain from the metabolites and, and allow the neuroimmune surveillance of the brain. In IIH, what do we have? We have an increase of CSF uh, in the perivascular spaces of the brain. So we have no hydrocephalus, we just have a, a big brain congestion. And this congestion, uh, I think, um, is probably due to the congestion of the lymphatic system. As I show, uh, the lymphatic system uh, is the circulation of CSF in the perivascular, of the perivascular spaces of the brain. And this uh, is a feature of IIH. In IIH, we have uh, big uh, edematous brain. You also have retention of fluids in the cranial nerve sheath. So this is a, is a typical uh, signs of IIH, which is, a, which is the accumulation of uh, CSF around the cranial nerve, here around the third cranial nerves, and along the optic nerves too, and also along the trigeminal cave here, uh, which, which correspond to the, as we said, previously said the indirect signs of IIH, but these are the usual signs of IIH. And finally, you have the third part of the triad, which is the restriction of the venous CSF outflow pathway, meaning that IIH is always, always associated with dural venous stenosis. Uh, and and the, this uh, has to be, I think, uh, um, uh, emphasized in this disease is that idiopathic intracranial hypertension is a venous disorder and is related to dural venous stenosis. So what, what is our uh, hypothesis in IIH and how can we try uh, to go further and to demonstrate this hypothesis? So we hypothesize that in IIH, we had an impairment, an initial impairment of the glymphatic, of the venous glymphatic drainage uh, just here. So after that, we don't know 
how it works first. So we don't know uh, what's going on in physiology here, but I think IIH is a perfect model of a dysfunction of this uh, piece of the puzzle. So this doesn't work. So the lymphatic system can't drain uh, in the vein. So you have a congestion of the lymphatic system here. You have an increase of CSF uh, in the subarachnoid space in the brain. And after that, you have the formation of the dural venous stenosis here. And this will produce a complete stop of the venous CSF outflow pathway. So you will have an excess of fluid in the lymphatic CSF outflow pathway, and you will have intracranial hypertension uh, because you have a big congestion of the lymphatic system. So we, in order to uh, prove our theory, uh, so we decided to build a translational study uh, in mice and in humans. So we all know that the underlying mechanism, the mechanism of the CNS free drainage at the perisinus are poorly understood and the implication of the venous circulation is still debated. In humans, idiopathic intracranial hypertension is a paradigmatic paradigmatic model of cerebral venous obstruction and uses chronic intracranial hypertension and CNS fluid retention. And in IIH, the bilater bilateral narrowing of the dural venous sin sinuses is caused by the loss of stiffness of the venous wall, which suggests a primary dysfunction of the perisinus in this patient. So we had to elucidate the pathophysiology of IIH we had first to uh, elucidate the physiology of the lymphatic drainage. And then we had to explore the perisinus alteration in patients with IIH. So in the first, uh, at the first aim, we uh, are currently investigating if and how the venous blood circulation coordinates with the lymphatic to ensure cns free homeostasis in mice. So this is an animal model of mice. Uh, which will allow to uh, better understand how the, the venous circulation is involved in the CNS free drainage from the lymphatic system. And our second aim is to characterize and to investigate uh, the anatomical and molecular alteration of the perisinus in patients with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So first we need to uh, understand the, the physiology of the venous CSF drainage and then we will try to characterize what, what's going on in the perisinus of patients with IIH. So the first uh, aim is an animal model. So we uh, uh, did a bilateral external and internal jugular ligature veins of our mice. Uh, and we, with this venous congestion, we, we tried uh, to, um, to highlight uh, the consequences of the venous hypertension uh, in mice, in the brain, in the perisinus, uh, in the, and uh, also uh, in the neurovascular system. So we studied the perisinus of our mice. So we studied the, how the lymphatic vessels react to the venous hypertension, uh, how the meningeal immune cells in the perisinus are impacted by the, by the venous hypertension, and how the cytoarchitecture of the perisinus is modified by the venous hypertension. Then we study uh, the neurovascular circulation. So we uh, explore how the venous system remodel after such uh, aggressive uh, venous ligature. Uh, we explore the direct venous permeability, the brain perfusion, and the blood-brain barrier permeability. We explore the CNS free drainage and first of all, the lymphatic circulation in our mice meaning is the lymphatic circulation impacted by the venous uh, uh, hypertension, uh, the ventricular CSF and the intracranial pressure. And we, we also assess uh, consequences on the consequences on the, on the brain and on the neuronal circuits, uh, because we have a lot of patients who complain for uh, cognitive disorders, which are, in my opinion, not only related uh, to the intracranial pressure, but also to the modification of the environment of the perisinus. So I don't have all the results of the study because we are currently investigating this. And uh, so you have the first result uh, of our experiments. 
And so we did the jugular ligature of the, of the, in the mice and we explored the, the lymphatic vessels at day two, day seven, day 14, and day 28 after the surgery. And we observed that when we ligature the vein, uh, the lymphatic vessels totally disappear uh, at the perisinus. So these two circulations are not compensatory, they are, they are more likely codependent, meaning when you, uh, when you attack the vein, you also attack the lymphatic vessels which circulate in the uh, perisinus of the dural venous sinuses. So this is interesting because in my, at the beginning, I saw that I will have an increase of volume of lymphatics, but it's exactly the opposite. As you can see, the lymphatics are in green here. So these are the sham, so it's a control mice. And at day seven, we have a complete disappearance of the green, uh, the green uh, um, marker. And so it means that we have a complete disappearance of the lymphatic vasculature after uh, in mice with venous hypertension. Interestingly, these vessels uh, reappear at day 14 and day 28. So we will be able to assess uh, the molecular mechanism of the disappearance of the vessel and of the regrowth of the vessels. It's uh, quickly the same for the size of the vessels. Uh, it decreases a lot at this day seven at the lateral sinuses. It doesn't change at the superior sagittal sinus. Uh, but all the, the lymphatic circulation is affected by the impairment of the venous. So what we need to do now is to uh, do a lot of other experiments. And we are currently testing uh, if uh, because the live one marker is a marker of uh, function of the lymphatic, but not a marker of uh, an anatomic marker. Uh, so we will use transgenic mice with a PROX1 uh, D tomato reporter, uh, which will allow to see if it's a loss of function of the lymphatic or if it's a complete disappearance of the vessel itself. We will also test the lymphatic drainage alteration with the IDSCO and light sheet microscopy. And we will also test how the immune cells which are trafficking in this perisinus are modified by the venous hypertension. And we will uh, assess the situ-architectural alteration of the perisinus with the electronic microscopy. Now we, after that, so we test if the, the cerebral venous outflow regulates the CNS free drainage and we had interesting results. So compared to humans, uh, the mice seems to be uh, less sensitive to the venous outflow impairment than humans. Uh, but we had a significant increase of the constant of the, of the intracranial pressure at day two after the surgery with a subsequent normalization at day seven and, uh, and after. But what is very interesting is that after venous ligature, you have a significant impairment of the lymphatic circulation here. So how did we uh, explore the lymphatic, the lymphatic circulation in our mice? Uh, we did the ligature, and after that, we injected, a cert we injected at day two, day seven, day 14, day 28, 30 minutes before the sacrifice of the mice, uh, a fluorescent tracer in the cisterna magna. So we could follow uh, the progression of the tracer and the progression in the brain and around the brain, and we could assess the fluorescence of the brain, meaning that the more the brain was fluorescent and more the tracer penetrated in the, in the perivascular spaces, and so more the lymphatic system was active. And in our uh, day 14 mice, we had a significant boost of the lymphatic system, uh, which is very interesting because it's uh, parallel to the uh, regrowth of the lymphatic vessels here. So we still don't know at that point if the venous system uh, impairs the lymphatic drainage through the disappearance of the lymphatics or if uh, the lymphatic system drains in the venous sinuses. So we, we, we need to go further and to still explore our, our mice with MRI and to try to explore how uh, the lymphatic system is impaired by venous hypertension. And uh, we had 
also had uh, something which is very interesting to me because a lot of my patients are complaining about uh, cognitive disorders uh, and it's always uh, like uh, um, not uh, uh, very known in IIH that these patients have cognitive disorders. Uh, and in our mice, we had a significant impairment of the behavioral tests, which are uh, which are um, which are delayed, so it, it they appear at day fourteen and day twenty eight, and the the mice the mice don't uh, recover from this behavioral modification. So we are we are doing uh, long term mice to see if at one point they will recover a normal behavior, but they seem to have a progressive disinhibition and an alteration of the uh, frontal area uh, in uh, in this uh, in this mice, meaning that uh, even if the intracranial pressure is normal, the alteration of the cerebral venous cells will induce behavioral um, behavioral uh, dysfunction in mice. So I think it's very important to notice that if uh, the cerebral venous cells flow and use cognitive impairment in mice, the impairment of the uh, independently from the intracranial pressure, uh, we need to restore a normal CSF venous, CN, normal venous uh, outflow in humans with idiopathic intracranial hypertension too. So after with this first aim uh, and this first study in mice, we are also exploring patients with IIH. And I thank all the French patients who agreed to go in the MRI for us. And uh, so to, to summarize a little bit, we will try to uh, explore the anatomical and molecular alteration of the pericytes in patients with IIH. Uh, so as I said before, uh, dural venous stenosis in IIH are causal and they are not uh, related to the intracranial pressure, meaning it's not because patients have intracranial hypertension that they secondarily have uh, venous stenosis. They have dural venous stenosis and the dural venous stenosis induce intracranial hypertension. And this intracranial hypertension is related to a loss of stiffness, stiffness of the perisinus. I think that the wall of the vein is, uh, is, uh, is very collapsible and so uh, this means that something is going on in the perisinus of this patient. Uh, the clinical presentation of IIH is age dependent and young patients have intracranial hypertension and older patients uh, have more isolated pulsatile tinnitus or CSF leaks. And the radiological presentation, it's still the same. The patient have dural venous stenosis, retention of fluid in the cranial nerve sheets, and the brain congestion and the congestion of the lymphatic system. So to uh, anatomically explore the perisinus of patient with IIH, we needed to improve the previously existing imaging of uh, the perisinus and of the lymphatic vessels in the brain. So the first imaging of the dual lymphatic networks in humans was performed by Absinta and they used the uh, vessel wall imaging sequences to explore the perisinus. Uh, this is a very smart uh, idea uh, because uh, vessel wall imaging is frequently used in arterial disorders, but in the venous system, I think it was the first time that someone had the idea to explore the, the wall of the dural venous sinuses. So we took this uh, sequence and we optimized it. Uh, and first of all, we, we coupled uh, this sequence with conventional vascular sequences and with an elliptic venous uh, sequences. We incorporated the Dante module, uh, which allowed a better suppression of the slow flow. So this technique allowed to uh, improve the resolution of the perisinus imaging. We increased the acquisition uh, at the head and at the, at the neck because we want to uh, explore the cervical lymph node in this patient and the dural lymphatics in this patient. And we use a software of segmentation, which is a 3D slicer uh, for reconstruction and quantification. And to, uh, to prove that we were uh, imaging uh, the dural lymphatics and the perisinus in, uh, in humans, we did a comparative study in mice and humans. So in mice, we explored the mice with uh, ID score. Uh, which is like a 3D microscopy. 
and uh, we and we study the drainage and uh, the anatomy of the lymphatic vessels uh, in the brain mouse. And in humans, we use the sequence that I previously detailed. So in humans, we enrolled 11 patients, male and females. We used the actual uh, protocol with uh, vessel wall imaging and the venous elliptic, and the 3D slicer post-processing, and we did the volumetric quantification. So this uh, optimization allowed to uh, go from this kind of imaging, which is the absinta imaging, which was the first one, to this kind of imaging. So as you can see, you have a precise delineation of the dual lymphatics here. Uh, and as you can see, the dura matter, which is uh, between the dural lymphatic, is not enhanced by the gadobutrol. So you uh, image only uh, the dural lymphatic vessels. You can easily extract, also extract the cervical lymph nodes at the neck, and you can quantify them. And you can get this kind of 3D reconstruction, which are very interesting from an anatomic point of view because. Uh, it's the first time that you, we can uh, delineate in three dimension uh, the lymphatic system in humans. And you can also do volumetric quantification and compare the patient between uh, different neurological disorders and with uh, healthy volunteers too. To uh, reinforce our uh, technique, we made the patient with a goram uh, syndrome. Uh, which correspond to uh, poly excessive proliferation of uh, lymphatic vessels, uh, which uh, lead to uh, a brain, uh, uh, sorry, a bone erosion. So as you can see, this patient has a large erosion of the bone here, which is related to uh, a lymphatic proliferation uh, at the area of the bone erosion. But what, what is very interesting is that um, we this technique uh, has a pronostic value. So as, as you can see, the lymphatic proliferation is not restricted to the area of bone erosion, but it, it's uh, along all the dural venous sinuses of the brain. So this is the patient with Gramsch too. This is a patient with MS. As you can see, the yellow, which corresponds to the dural lymphatic, is uh, much more uh, important in patients with Gramsch too than in patients with MS. And with quantification of the, of the volume of lymphatic, we have a, we have a significant uh, significant uh, higher volume of lymphatic in the patient with goram -Schnitt. And uh, with this study, we were able to, uh, to prove that the meningeal lymphatic vessels are not located only around the superosagital sinus or the transverse sinus, but you have lymphatic vessels uh, in the wall of all the dural sinuses of the brain, meaning that the lymphatics and the venous circulation are totally parallel and are totally codependent between them. So if you want to explore the lymphatic system, you need to explore uh, the venous system too. And another uh, imaging uh, feature, which is very interesting, is that we, with this technique, we are able to detect uh, these tiny channels uh, connecting the bone with the dura mater, and which may be involved in the, in the trafficking of myeloid cells from the hematopoietic niche of the bone of the calvaria to the dural venous, uh, to the dural perisinus and to the brain. So this is very interesting uh, in a neurological disorder uh, with neuroinflammation because we can see this channel and we can quantify them. So this is a very interesting parameter. And as you can see, again, this tiny yellow channel is always parallel to a tiny vein here. So again, these two circulation have to be considered together. And with this technique, we are able to have a lymphatic volume quantification, uh, which is uh, interesting to uh, build uh, clinical trials. And uh, with a very low number of patients, uh, we were able to, uh, to observe a significant difference of lymphatic volumes between female and male. And in the topic of IIH, I think this is a very interesting pattern because IIH affects mainly uh, uh, females and not males. So probably uh, there is uh, there is something uh, to to say to 
explore here like why female have less lymphatic than male and also uh, we need to this may be uh, interesting to explain the woman vulnerability to neuroinflammation so, such as uh, uh, multiple sclerosis or dermatological disorders such as idiopathic intrafamilial hypertension or meningioma uh, for example and uh, the other thing is, if you want to explore and compare uh, the dual lymphatic vascularization uh, with uh, in a clinical study, you need to uh, group your patient per age and uh, per gender. So you have to compare female with female and male with male. So the next step uh, uh, and the current step, we are currently enrolling patients in the patient in the lymph Magic project, uh, which aim to compare uh, the, the perisinus and the dural lymphatics in patients with IIH versus healthy volunteers and to try to uh, go further and to see if the lymphatic vessels are more uh, developed in patients with IIH or if I, they are less developed, uh, if the volume of the cervical lymph nodes are, are the same in patients with IIH or not. Um, and uh, this will help us to maybe add another piece of the puzzle to check if it's a lymphatic disorder, if it's a venous disorder, if it's a venolymphatic disorder. So we are currently uh, enrolling patients. We already have uh, uh, 10 healthy volunteers and eight patients with IIH which are uh, enrolled, uh, but I don't have uh, the, res the results of the study uh, yet. And finally, to, uh, to find the, the molecular and the biological cause of IIH, uh, we are planning to do a molecular exploration in patients with IIH, uh, and we will collect uh, dural venous endothelial cells uh, in patients uh, who will have a, a dural venous stenting. Uh, so after stenting, as the stent will um, a little bit um, uh, be aggressive on the venous endothelium, we will be able to sort endothelial cells and to do uh, RNA and DNA sequences on these cells. And we will uh, also try to sample dura matter in this patient, uh, in patients who will have a, a CSF shunt for IIH, and we will sample dura matter during the surgery, and we will try to study uh, the, M the lymphatic anatomy in this patient and try also to find uh, to find some uh, molecular abnorm abnormality with uh, RNA and DNA sequencing. Uh, as you can see, I'm pretty much uh, uh, sure that um, the, the initial uh, trigger in IIH is located in the perisinus and that uh, this may be a, a target of a future um, of the development of future uh, drugs to treat IIH with a specific target and uh, to be uh, less invasive on this patient, even if uh, venous stenting works very well. Uh, I think we may be more effective uh, if we finally get the pathophysiology of this disease. I thank you for your attention. I don't know if you have any question, don't hesitate, I'm, I'm here. Wow, that was a very high level uh, conference. Thank you, uh, Stephanie, that was uh, exceptional. Um, and uh, thank you for presenting the intermediary results of your research because some of this has not been published yet, uh, has it? No, no. So Okay, so <laughs> but, uh, I think so if you, you, have think to, you, you have to let us know um, how much uh, how much of it do you want to be on our website because if it's on the website accessible to everyone then it's uh, you know then it's out there then so you yeah. have to let no, us I... know you know give us the green light to put this talk on the website accessible to everyone no you can put on the website we are already uh, well advanced and i hope we will publish uh, uh, either at the end of the year or beginning of next year. So uh, the mice are, are done and uh, the imaging are, are currently uh, performed. So I think you can, you can go and put this on the website. There is no secret in here. 
Thank you. Great um, talk, Dr. Link. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, um, I have a question regarding uh, the pathophysiology of just plain old glymphatic to venous drainage. It seems like your um, experiments are really coming from a model of jugular obstruction, which would be like an obstructive pattern that's coming from big veins in the neck. I, I'm curious to know if you guys have explored, uh, for example, uh, blockage of these perivascular spaces with proteinaceous fluid in the CSF or even blood as to model, for example, communicating hydrocephalus after subarachnoid hemorrhage. I think there would be a lot of analogy between both disease processes in the elegant pathophysiology that you've uncovered uh, with, with your neuroimaging in humans and mice models? Ah, yes, thank you. It's a very good question. Uh, but the issue uh, in injecting uh, directly, for example, blood in the, in the CSF is that you don't know where it's blocked. It's probably blocked uh, at the level of the periarterial spaces instead of at the perisinus. Uh, it's very, it was very difficult to, I think it's impossible to get a perfect model uh, of IIH. Uh, uh, first, because we don't know the pathophysiology, and then because uh, obviously we don't know how uh, the CSF or the ISF from the lymphatic system is drained in the perisinus or in the circulating sinus. And uh, it's, it's still a very debated uh, if the venous uh, system, the circulating venous blood, uh, drains the CSF. In the scientific community, uh, people say that uh, there is no venous drainage of CSF. Uh, I think we are working in the veins and we all know that if we impact the vein, we have CSF uh, drainage issues. So um, the models are not, not good, I think, because uh, we miss something at the perisinus and then because we have animals that don't correspond to humans because, uh, for example, the, the drainage uh, at the nose of the CSF at the nose in uh, in animals is is much uh, it's linear than in humans, and the internal jugular veins in humans are very developed and they are not as developed in mice or in quadruped quadruped uh, spaces. So, I think to go further, we need to explore the venous physiology on monkeys because they have the more, uh, um, uh, like uh, th their venous anatomy is more likely than ours. Uh, and the other thing is that probably with, by exploring patients with IIH, they will help us to uh, explore uh, the venous physiology like in normal conditions. Uh, it was my, my idea, but with this model of, of mice, the, I just wanted to check if it, if uh, altering the venous circulation would impact the CNS drainage in mice. It was, I know it's not a perfect model, but uh, we are still stuck at this point that we can't have a perfect model of IIH. That's why I want to give you my uh, presentation is because if you have ideas, if someone in the world has an, has an idea of how to model IIH uh, in mice, I would be very interesting to work on it with uh, with such pe such people. I have a question for the uh, audience. Where can we find your MRI protocol to study the glymphatic system in human? Yeah, it's uh, published in the Journal of Experimental Medicine. Uh, I can send you the link. So um, yeah. I think the question is from uh, Carlo Cavalieri. So if you uh, send it to, to us, Stephanie, we will uh, forward it to uh, Carlo. OK, OK. Uh, everything is public. So <laughs> OK. And I think um, we need to, to collaborate on this uh, uh, research because uh, we are very close to, to the goal. Uh, and if we find the pathophysiology, we will help the people a lot. 
Uh, I have another question from the uh, audience. Uh, will you be follow up uh, mails with uh, IH? Is it possible that there are over considerations in mails with IH, such as compression of the internal jugular vein, uh, you know, lower than the brain, styloid, C1, uh, etc.? Why is it so different in male than in female? I mean, not only yeah, because but... of the lymphatic system, but maybe because of different type of venous compression or what explanation? Yes, um, I think you have uh, venous hypertension, which are related to external jugular vein stenosis, for example. Uh, these patients don't have, in my opinion, IIH. Uh, for me, IIH is uh, related to uh, 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 stenosis of the dural venous sinuses. Uh, and so you have to, idiopathic intracranial hypertension is, is a very bad uh, name for this disease because uh, you can put everything in this and because you consider the symptom and not the cause. Uh, patient, uh, I think we have to consider a disease which would be stenotic venodural disorder and which can manifest with idiopathic intracranial hypertension, CSF leaks, uh, or pulsatile tinnitus. And uh, we are doing stenting. We know that in this patient, we are curing the patient with venous stenting, uh, and they are all females. They are all they have all they are all overweight, overweight, and it's always the same uh, phenotype of patients. Uh, and these patients have uh, lateral sinus stenosis, bilateral. Uh, but you can have intracranial hypertension from venous origin with stenosis, which are uh, at the neck or. Uh, due to compression by a tumor or other, and these are not uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. I think the issue is that the name of the disease is very bad because we don't consider patients with CSF leaks or with uh, pulsatile tinnitus, and they have this stenotic venodural disorder. Uh, and we put in, uh, in, uh, in the case of IIH uh, patients with Intracranial hypertension of venous origin, uh, wh wh whatever the cause is, cerebral venous thrombosis or, sten or jugular stenosis, but it's not the same disorders. Oh, so I have a kind of a slight disagreement there. When, <laughs> when, <laughs> when you say that uh, dural venous stenosis are causal, uh, and that we cure patients by stunting them. I will uh, kind of disagree. We improve them, uh, but we don't cure them. No, I mean, yeah. uh, we cure we the improve the symptom yeah. tremendously. It's certainly the best surgical or, or even medical, if you compare to, to drugs, doing a venous and a stunting is the best technique that we have, but we don't cure them we, we we just improve them i i agree we cure intracranial hypertension but uh, uh that's why we are that's why we are working on this because if we understand how it works and if we find the the, the target of uh, an eventual medication uh, we will be more 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 effective on all the symptoms of the patient especially headache or cognitive uh, disorders or and uh, I agree with you, the patients still have headache or they, they are not completely cured and they can have recurrence after stenting. And, uh, but I think it's the best we have for now. Uh, but I think it's all, stenting was, was also um, a very good way to understand uh, the pathophysiology of IIH. Uh, because we have a direct impact uh, on the on the disease, so uh, I think we can do better. And I think my purpose is to uh, stop interventional neuroradiology in 10 years when I will have the medication of this disease. <laughs> but for now, I think I will continue to put stents in the vein, even if it's not the perfect uh, treatment. So uh, Sandeep Mangla from uh, New York has a kind of a complex question. Sandeep, do you want to to, to sure, to, sure. Uh, Thanks. Yeah, Thanks. unmute yourself and just ask your question. Sure, Pierre. Thanks.
Thank you. Uh, yeah, tremendous uh, work, uh, Professor Link. Um, and very well designed studies. My question is, you know, I think now that we're kind of rediscovering the glial lymphatic system as, as a major, you know, uh, functional, uh, you know, pathway in the brain, maybe we should be rethinking a lot of things. You know, I think, you know, I know you, I know you looked at MS, you know, in a few patients, but I think, you know, I think there was this longstanding theory that potentially multiple sclerosis might be a venous disease. Venous stenting was proposed for that 10 years ago. You know, uh, you know, I think that's one area where I'm thinking, well, well, we know there's this pattern that's associated with what looks like a venous drainage. Maybe that's the glial lymphatic system that is perhaps involved in multiple sclerosis. That would be question number one. And then just real quick, I think the other thing that we often see is small, you know, white matter changes as people get older, you know, and we attribute them to small vessel ischemic disease, even though the patterns don't necessarily make complete sense. I mean, I think, you know, if we're thinking of watershed, distal small vessel ischemic disease, it's going to be in the sense, you know, deep white matter, but we often see it in the periventricular spaces and and, and not in necessarily patients that that have high um, you know uh, risk factors for for vascular disease. Could that also be a disorder of the glial lymphatic system as we age, and sometimes in, in younger patients? Thank you. Sorry, too complicated question that Pierre said. No, uh, it's not that complicated, but uh, you know, I, we are working on it. I think the the veins have to be uh, more considered that that it, that it was previously. Uh, so. I work on IIH, but we also work on uh, multiple sclerosis or neurodegenerative disorders in the Paris Brain Institute. Uh, and I think, in my opinion, IIH is a model of dysfunction of, uh, of the venous drainage of the glymphatic system, but there are a lot of, of application. You saw in our, uh, in our mice, we see that um, if we increase the venous pressure, uh, we impair uh, the mice behavior and the neuroinflammation too. And so in MS, for example, I don't think that the stenosis is causal, but I think it can uh, precipitate the disease or it can worsen the disease because you see all the neuroimmunity uh, in the brain, it's at the borders of the venous dural sinuses. So if you we increase the pressure in the vein, you impair uh, the immune cell trafficking and you may increase the neuroinflammation. So for sure, I think, so we say these people are crazy to stand the vein and it doesn't work and this is crazy, but I'm not sure it's that crazy. I don't think that uh, stenting is the treatment for everything, but the venous outflow is very important uh, if you want to manage neuroinflammation. And uh, we will understand more and more how the venous system connects with the lymphatic, connect with the immune cell at the perisinus, and how it uh, participates to the neuroimmunity and the neuroimmune surveillance. And uh, maybe we will be able to target this circulation to play on the on the brain in, on the neuroinflammation in the brain. So it's a it's a big area of research because we are opening a new. Uh, a new area of, uh, and we, we think differently. We think in, in circulation, but we don't think in stroke, we think in drainage. And, uh, and we know that the lymphatic um, uh, drain as the fluid from the brain and the brain metabolites. And we know that the veins uh, contributes to the lymphatic maintenance and maybe drains the, the fluid from the brain too. Uh, so, if we have target on this venolymphatic circulation and on this, I would say, garbage of the brain, uh, we will be able to help in a lot, a lot of neurological disorders because we are uh, at the end of the lymphatic system. And if we can boost the system, uh, we can improve the neuroinflammation and we can probably improve neurodegeneration by uh, cleaning the brain from its metabolites. So I think. IIH will help a lot, a lot of patients with other neurological disorders because they will help us to understand how it works. And for uh, white matter changes, I also agree with you. Uh, it can be related to uh, like a, a glymphatic uh, impairment and of a stasis of, uh, of CSF in the perivascular spaces, especially because 
the lymphatic vessels they grow uh, in the postnatal uh, area in uh, young adults or old kids, teenagers, and after they disappear uh, in aging people after 60 years old. So this system is, uh, we, we are trying to explore this system in many neurological disorders, and I think it's just the beginning of, uh, of the story, and I hope uh, we will find a lot of, uh, of uh, pathophysiology with, uh, by exploring this, uh, this system. And what about normal pressure hydrocephalus? Ah, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, I think it's different because uh, in normal pressure hydrocephalus, you have a lot of uh, CSF in the ventricles. Uh, it's not in the perivascular spaces of the brain. I don't know if it's a choroid plexus, uh, disorder or but uh, I don't know a lot of people who have a big interest in I in a normal pressure hydrocephalus want to explore the lymphatics in these conditions uh, here I don't have a, a very well uh, uh, we we'll say a constructed theory on a normal pressure hydrocephalus so it's not that you don't know is that no one knows uh, I don't know. Maybe someone has an idea <laughs> okay. and can explore it. I think it's very interesting because we can explore the lymphatics, we can explore the perifinus, and uh, it's a new area. So I think we should go and uh, and dig and try to find uh, uh, a lot of uh, I don't know pathophysiological mechanism or in all these disorders which are of unknown of origin. So we are almost at the hour now, and I see that no one else has some question. Uh, does um, uh, guys, do you, do you have any question to ask us, uh, Stephanie, before we close the, the session? Okay, it looks like there are too many questions to ask one question specifically. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, Again, uh, we will send to anyone who's interested in more of uh, Dr. Link's research, uh, the MRI protocol, we can send that as well. And any clinical questions we'll pass to um, Dr. Gobin. Uh, next lecture will be on Monday, June 12th. The time will be announced in hopefully a week or so but it will be with Dr. Sofia Cienfuegos. She is a PhD in human, uh, in human nutrition. And the topic will be on the impact of weight bias and stigma on patients with obesity and IIH. So we look forward to that lecture in a few weeks. And if anyone is signed up for the IIH practitioner series, you will receive a Zoom link a week prior and some reminders on the way. And thank you so much for participating and on the chat and we look forward to seeing you soon.